Welcome to Season 7, Episode 9 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday the 28th of May and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat thingamajig on the website and in the hash UUPC IRC channel. I'm Tony and joining me this week, well we have a full house again. Alan's here. Hello. Mark is here. Hello. And Laura's here. Hello. Excellent. Well, we are going to have a, uh, there's a lot of news <laughs> well, let's get on with it then. Well, we can't quite get on with it because the right. previous jingle hasn't yet ended. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a new show. Yeah, and you know, there's concurrency issues here. <laughs> but yeah, Sounds like a bug in your script. <laughs> Sounds like a smooth running show. <laughs> ah! And yeah, we're going to get on with some news. Uh, so eBay has announced that a security breach has led to customer data being stolen. Uh oh. So did you get an Whoops. email immediately about this? No, I got an email about two days after I found out about it on the news. Yeah, I think. yeah, I found Ooh. out about it and didn't hear anything. And so then I went to the eBay website and it had a thing saying you should reset your password and click a link. And it was only later on that evening that I got the email telling me I should reset my password. Oh, why aren't they just resetting all passwords automatically? Um, that's a good question. Because if you go to click a link and reset it anyway. Yeah. Ooh, Ooh. you sound interesting. Let's <laughs> let's deal with that as well. We? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, interestingly, I vaguely saw something about it. I might have received an email, I don't remember, but... I was told by my wife that I need to change my <laughs> my eBay <laughs> password today. Now that's mainstream. Yeah, that was today because <laughs> I was um, uh, I took a day off today and I was uh, eBaying some stuff with for the kids. They they wanted to sell some of their toys, old toys. Oh. Oh, so right. I was taking photos and putting them on eBay. And um, yeah, Claire said, uh, "Have you changed your eBay password?" I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How would you know about that? Apparently, she saw it in the news. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it there was pretty much everywhere, which is kind yeah. of unusual. It's kind of interesting as well because they've said that the encrypted passwords were stolen, which presumably means the hashes Let's of the passwords. Hope they mean the hashes of the passwords and they're not storing passwords encrypted. And in- interestingly, when you change your password, you're limited to a 20 character password. Oh, good. No, maybe they are yes. storing them stupidly then. Because yeah. I've started using KeyPass, and if I try and get it to generate, there are certain websites that won't accept any of the generated yeah. passwords. Oh, yeah, I had an automatically generated password for a website that didn't accept uh, something like square brackets or something. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That means, that means they're not hashing your password. Yeah, it means you're or, vulnerable. Or it, was, or it was written by some complete idiot who doesn't understand passwords. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you which site. Why not? Go on. Then we won't use it. Mostly because I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly. Um, yeah, so yeah, they were very keen to make it clear that no financial data was stolen, although customer names, email addresses, physical addresses, phone numbers, and dates of birth were stolen. Yeah, but so e- as long as there wasn't any financial data stolen, that's fine. Doesn't eBay tend to use PayPal? And if you've got the password and the email address, <laughs> you don't need financial data. <laughs> You'd hope that people had no, they're not going to have separate. No, but no, they link they link yeah. the two together, don't they? Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, no, actually, you, you still for have me, to enter a password into PayPal. For me, it, do, d- yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't link because every time I buy something on eBay, at the end of the at the end of the transaction, it says, "Hey, would you like to pay and connect your two accounts?" And I go, oh, "Well, I have no other option." And I press the button, and it goes, "We failed to do it this time," <laughs> <laughs> and it does it every single time. I don't know why. Hey, <laughs> you're just a bug in the system. I am. I am a bug. Yes, that's what I've heard on the internet. Mm. Um, the breach occurred between late February and early March, um, but it wasn't made public until just this week. So there's a big question as to what. What was going yeah. on in those couple of months? Because yeah, we could have done with knowing to change our passwords in the in the two intervening months in which someone had our encrypted passwords and was presumably trying to crack them. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm. I mean, they could well have been ordering things through eBay <laughs> through your account. I feel super smug because my eBay password was a very long one generated by LastPass the last time that my <laughs> things got hacked. <laughs> so so I feel quite good about that. And now I've got an even longer one. <laughs> yeah get me get you yes well there we go good luck eBay. so have you got 20 characters in your password now maybe <laughs> i oh, certainly yeah. don't have more <laughs> <laughs> fewer passwords uh okay um enough about ebay i think yep. uh, a german hacker has discovered that windows xp machines employed as point of sale terminals or essentially cash registers um can continue receiving updates until 2019. Uh, so these are the updates which are 
um, we we spoke about before. Some people like the UK government have paid exorbitant amounts to get um, updates continue for whatever. But mm. if you're if your um, if your Windows XP machine identifies itself as running POS ready software. Um, then it continues to get the updates for free anyway. And the way it determines this is by a registry key, which you can set yourself. Hooray! Hooray. And uh, Windows Update will say, oh, you're a POS terminal, and give you the, uh, uh, give you the updates. I wonder if they'll block that, or yeah. will that be difficult for them to do, given know. there'll be so many machines out well, in the they wild to, they can't yeah. They'd have to update with. them all. I mean, yeah. 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 One of the whole things about point-of-sale machines is they're embedded things that people don't go near yeah. and touch very often. Mm. Hurrah. Yeah, so would you be able to... Would you be able to stop it happening to machines it shouldn't do while still allowing the POS terminals to update? But mm. obviously, the 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 question is why are people still running Windows XP on you know? Uh, because it's supported until twenty nineteen. Apparently, well, of course, yes. But isn't it? You know, it's a bit old and crusty now. Yeah, yeah. But it's the only thing that my point of sale machine at home will run on. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, can't get the people through the door without it. Yes. I guess, I guess it's inevitable, really, that someone's going to work around that. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. So all it's going to do is make people stay on old mm. software. Yes, and yeah, I, so I, it's count it's counterintuitive that you know yeah. people would want to do that. So I'm, come I'm, 2019, everyone's going to be like, "Oh no, you can't take it away from yeah. us. Our point of sale systems use yeah. it." Yeah, exactly. I, I managed to convince uh, a um, the project which I'm making a web app for at work at the moment that. We don't need to support IE8 because IE8 is only available on Windows XP and Windows XP isn't supported anymore. Ah. I was so happy to be able to make that argument. <laughs> well done, you. Happy days. Uh, moving on, the Linux Foundation has started offering an introduction to Linux course through edX. The course promises to provide a good working knowledge of Linux from the GUI and command line, familiarity with major distributions, and the basis for going on to become a system administrator. The course starts on 1st of August and is expected to take between 40 and 60 hours to complete. What's edX when it's at home? Uh, it's a company that do like training it's a, stuff. a massively open online course system, or MOOC. MOOC. Yes. It is a MOOC. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, when you sign up, you get two options. You can either pay $250 for the certificate and then start the course, or you can <laughs> you can uh, tick a box that says I can't afford to pay or I don't want to pay, and there's a little box where you can fill in a form that says why you don't you shouldn't have to pay, like maybe right. like restricted income or something like that. Or you 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 get a field where you can make an argument why you don't have to pay, but then <laughs> there's a third option where you tick the third box which says I just want to audit the course, <laughs> which lets you go All through right. the course and not do the certificate at the end. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. um, but you, I think you can op- opt in to the certificate later. Right, I see. But, um, so yeah. do you know how this might compare with something like the LPI, the Linux Professional Institute qualification? I would expect it would uh, compare favourably with the it LPI, exists. but I haven't <laughs> I haven't seen it yet because uh, I've only just signed up and it doesn't start until the 1st of August. Ah, did you go for the audit the cause option? Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's got, got a nice intro video by Linus Torvalds as well telling yes. you about... Why he thinks Linux think, is cool. I think that was that was that was quite a pull for people to see, you know, Linux um you know, ab- advertising this this yeah. this Linux course, which I thought was quite cool, but I think some people thought he was gonna give the whole course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if, you, if you scroll down the page you see it's actually another guy from the Linux Foundation. It's uh, actually Stephen Fry. Brian. <laughs> Brian Linux. Yes. That's uh. his name. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's good. It's great to have a yeah. system whereby you know people can uh, learn how to be a system administrator on Linux. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, getting people engaged. MOOCs are very popular these days, um, and people are able to engage with them all around the world. And if it's a structured course that gives you some sort of certification at the end of it, why not? Mm. Yeah, and it's from you know an actual rec- you know the Linux Foundation isn't just you know some guy in his basement who says I know about Linux. If you have a certificate from the Linux Foundation saying you've completed an introduction to Linux course, that's actually yeah you know, going to be a fairly well. The Linux Foundation is thing. several guys in their basement, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but being well, paid to be in their basement. Yeah, yeah. The, the LP. I mean, I, it's different for me. I'm not a system administrator, but I, it, do people still? Uh, look for LPI as a as a requirement on uh, recruit CV or I don't know I've not seen it no I've um, not I've seen the stuff it. like that people just generally want proof of experience really in that or Red Hat field. rel yeah oh yeah, yeah no yeah you do see that yeah I yeah. I just haven't come across LPI for years 
No. No, I think mine's expired now. Oh, you had it? Oh, yes, you did. You had the books and everything, didn't you? Yeah, I did LPI level one, which was two exams years and years and years ago. I think it's a five year thing and I think it probably expired. I think five our, years ago. But the content yeah. of the exam hasn't changed at all in those five years, has it? They, that's they have why they still asked you about IRQs and yeah, TTYs and, and that's concurring. why I didn't do it in the end because I was sort of interested in doing, but it just didn't seem relevant. A lot of it. I right. think they have revitalised the uh, course content somewhat. But yeah, yeah. when so I did it, about USB ports and not serial ports. <laughs> yeah, literally when I did it, it was you know configuring ISA cards and right. you know, ten megabit I networking. Don't know what you just said. <laughs> 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 so sweet yeah and um yeah so good luck to anybody who wants yeah. to get involved with that in fact if you do um and you uh have a go let us know what you thought of it and whether uh, it's the sort of thing you'd like to see more of mm. podcast at ubuntu-uk.org and um, mozilla has published an article discussing the reasons for um it once again giving up on its principles by supporting drm for html5 video in firefox um, the rationale for the decision centres on prioritising user requirements to access video from services like Netflix over Mozilla's own moral objections. So we we talked about this last time, I think, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the, this particular thing. Well, or, the fact that Mozilla had decided to allow DRM support in Firefox, not necessarily their reasons. Yes, they because they'd also yeah. I mean, previously they backed down on supporting um, uh, H.264 after Cisco said that they could provide it royalty free. Right. And then, yeah, then they backed down and yeah, then they said that they were going to, in some form, support. It, this is the encrypted media extensions W3C standard, uh, which is basically a, a standard API for a DRM for video. Mm. Um, yes, and this is them saying how they're actually going to achieve it, which is with, by having a piece of proprietary software from Adobe. Okay. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Well, they, they, their argument is that it, it's going to be better than other people's because it's going to have um, a, an open source wrapper around it, which <laughs> which um, basically... Yeah, we're going to put this proprietary thing inside a blocked box yeah, basically, and then that's wrap what, it in an open source wrapping paper. That's, that's okay. Pretty much what they... Because that way... Well, what they're saying is that one of the bad things about this, about, about the content decryption module which is what this proprietary blob is called is that um they try and lock the content to a particular device by looking at the device and collecting lots of identifiable information about it um whereas by having it in this open source wrapper they can lock it off from the rest of the system and just provide it with a a fingerprint which like a generated fingerprint which has nothing to do with what's on the system it just says this is the fingerprint for this system to what end so that then they can say okay you can play it on the system which generates this thing so for example if you're if you're viewing some content from a a content provider like netflix or something they may have some requirement that says it can only be played on one device or it might be that it can only be played on devices of a certain size or form factor so they might have a license that says you can only play this on mobile devices you can't play on tvs or something like that so that with that fingerprint you can identify yeah. what the device without is. it having to actually go into your system and say oh let's have a look at um you know your configuration stuff and oh look there's some stuff in your personal dir- your personal files as well i might accidentally have a look at that so what drm generally does well the yeah the, the mozilla's mozilla's idea is that it could potentially do that so they want to stop it doing that ah, okay by providing this wrapper for it mm-hmm. to run in yeah i guess you don't know what it's doing because it's binary exactly. and proprietary that's yeah. the point isn't right. it? yeah so they want you not to be scared of that. But also... But surely yeah. the whole reason for this needing to exist is because without it, Firefox becomes irrelevant. Because that's nobody essentially, will use yes. it. So that's what they've said, essentially, right. that everyone will have to use another browser because they want to watch Netflix. Right. I don't. I've never used Netflix. No, I know a few people have been well, disappointed by it. Netflix is the one example. Yeah. But there are, there are plenty of other examples. The of, film, the same idea. Yeah, and... Um, and, and those are just the big Western ones. Mm. In, yes. in individual countries, there will be other local uh, content uh, networks. Or uh, and to be fair, it's not the networks so much as the people that they license them from, isn't it? Mm, to some degree, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's you know, if if given that it's now a a standard thing that's being implemented in web browsers, it wouldn't it would annoy me, it would annoy the hell out of me, but it wouldn't surprise me if the BBC said they were going to do it with iPlayer, for example, right? Instead of using Flash. Of course, mm. the the other thing is that this is you know a piece of proprietary software which is being developed by Adobe, and you know we don't yet know if Adobe are going to be releasing it for Linux. Yeah, they don't have a good track record of that. No. Oh, recently. so if they yeah, 
So if they say, oh, well, it's not available for Linux, then we can't watch the stuff on Linux anyway. So that, that'd be nice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that that's really good news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it kind of sucks all around, except for Mozilla, who now continue to be slightly relevant. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose the other the other platforms. the other way to to look at the platform thing is that you know Firefox's big thing is Firefox OS, and Firefox OS runs on Linux. So you'd hope that if they're going to support this as a solution, then they're going to be you know saying to Adobe that we want to support this and it needs to work on Linux for us to support it hmm. yeah well we shall see we shall see watch this space oh and uh, gaming news Tony oh, well, unfortunately we've only got about 45 seconds Go for uh, it. left oh, in this segment so it will be really difficult Always. to get oh, oh it's only a short one Tony I'm sure that you can you can you know you can be succinct about these things tell well, us about this Kickstarter project well one doesn't like to rush these things you know there is but uh, I think you should there's a certain amount of depth one has to go into when you know as much about the subject as I do <laughs> you can't just skim across the top of it. we've got TikTok. two bullet points to cover come well, on there's only 20 seconds left of, of the text. That's 10 seconds per bullet point. Go. Okay. Well, all right, you, you know. Okay, pin back your ears. Listen, <laughs> you're about to learn something. Following a successful wow. crowdfunding campaign last summer, the Liadworks game engine and development <laughs> environment has released its Linux port. The software is available for S200. In That's the, a dollar sign, you uh, fool. The, uh, $200, $200 <laughs> yes. in the Ubuntu Software Center. And uh, games developed using the Liadworks engine can be distributed or sold royalty-free. Yes. No DRM there, then. So you can make games on Linux for Linux. Using, uh, for just $200. Yes, or if, like me, you backed the uh, Kickstarter, you get, you get it for significantly less. Oh, how many games have you developed? Uh, none yet, because it doesn't work on an Intel graphics card. Hey. Ah. Yep. Win. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're out of time now. Gosh. Yeah. I know you. I know you could talk about that all day, Tony. Yeah, yeah. I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. I guess see. we'll have to move on to the community news. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that pleases, puzzles, or piques you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content, and that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. And now it's time for the community news. And first off, if you've uh, been not reading the internet for the past couple of weeks and not heard, a friend of the show and Ubuntu community manager, the internet's John O'Bacon, is leaving Canonical to work at the XPRIZE Foundation. Yes, his last day is tomorrow if you're listening to this live. Today, wow. if you've just downloaded it, or last week, if you're all listening to next week's show. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he tried. <laughs> 29th wow. of May, yeah. His last so, day. so, congratulations, John O. Yes, well done. Yeah, so he's being escorted from the building. Uh, <laughs> well, he <laughs> works from home. Order. So, yeah. His wife is kicking him out of the house. Yes. Um, so, tell us about XPRIZE then. XPRIZE does what? Um, they fund, like competition to come up with cool things like they funded the uh, competition to invent a medical tricorder like they have on uh, star trek okay mm. and other similar sort of help the world type things right philanthropic quests kind of they they get well, uh yeah they're philanthropic back. quests to win a lot of money <laughs> well yeah but the the people who are putting the money up are philanthropists oh yes okay, people yes, like yes. um elon musk from um the tesla oh, uh, yeah. car company he puts up some money for for them and uh, other like, yeah. Yeah. people do as well. So he's going to be managing that community or helping develop yes, a community. Yes, building a community around. around everything that XPRIZE does, each of the, each of the individual projects, because they have multiple projects that they're working on at any point in time. Mm. And, uh, yeah, he's building communities around those. Wow. So I guess we wish Jono all the best for yes, that. Yes, um, absolutely. He's been, I think, one of the two people who we've interviewed most on this show over the seven yes, years. Yes, him and Stuart Langridge. And yeah, now absolutely. neither of them work for Canonical anymore, so I guess it's going to remain a tie. Yeah. <laughs> Unless one of them just suddenly decides they want to talk to us. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Miracles might happen. Um, but yes, so what will happen with the role of community manager? Um, uh, that's an excellent question, and it's going to be... As I understand it, resourced internally, so it's not going to be his, his job won't be advertised Damn. externally. Because they've got quite a team now, haven't they? Yeah, it's it's oh, funny yeah. calling cool. him the community manager. There's actually like five community he managers. He manages them, doesn't he? He manages the team of community managers. Yeah, a community of community managers. Exactly. <laughs> community is that the, what, a, what a clutch of community yeah. managers is called? 
uh, yes, yes. <laughs> a gaggle or whatever. There are plenty of other words that have spring to mind. But yes, <laughs> it's uh, so there will be uh, someone taking on that role. Yeah. Oh well. well yes. Mm. Well, good luck, Johnny. Mm. That's what you say. Yeah. Good it, luck. In other news, Fedora project leader Robin Oldrat <laughs> Bergeron <laughs> has mm-hmm. announced she's stepping down. Yes. So uh, I think it's they've just released their release that they've just done. <laughs> Duh. Fedora just 20, isn't it? Yes. Words are hard. And now, <laughs> apparently very much so this evening, um, and now she's sort of stepping down early in the development cycle. Um, right. The next. She's not stepping down immediately. She's announced her intention to do so right. early in the development cycle for the next release. Um, but yeah, so I think she leaves the uh, the project in good condition and good stead for the future. Mm. So yeah, best of luck with her as well. We're not clear whether she's going to work for X Prize as well. <laughs> <laughs> maybe she's going to be a community manager. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's a, there's a vacancy going. Um, so yeah, so user experience designer Giorgio Venturi has blogged about the design for the web browser on Ubuntu for phones, looking at a new way of ham- handling tabs and history. Yeah, Two yeah, very so important aspects. Yeah, t- um, so Giorgio works in the uh, the canonical design team, and he's working on a few apps, and one of them is the web browser um and uh yeah he's got quite a lengthy post about how you navigate through your history and how you navigate to new um uh, new pages how you choose them from from the list of things you've been to before and how you flip between your most recent um so how would you uh, tabs how would you describe this very visual paradigm on a podcast <laughs> I, I would i would direct I would you to the video URL. which we all is is in his post which we'll link to in the show notes yes Oh, okay, yeah. but, but briefly, oh, it, focus basically, on recency. Yeah, basically, the 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 stuff all sort of it's like instead of having tabs in a bar, you have them in a stack, and each time you visit something, it goes to the top of the stack and pushes everything down. And so okay. when you bring up a list of all your tabs and with the most recent ones at the top in order of this stack. So rather than have like a bazillion tabs open with the ones over on the far left being really um, ones that you use quite a lot and having to switch between one on the far right that you're currently using and the one on the far left that you've been using like all day and then having 20 in the middle that you, you may or, or may not be, to be able to read. Exactly. <laughs> you, you have the two that you flip between. M- much like you on a desktop, you alt tab between yeah. like if you do fast alt tab, you switch between two activities that you're that you're on like. see i was gonna say that i thought uh, the um chrome browser on my android phone did something similar and it sort of does a bit i think um opera mini does something a little bit like that as well mm. though maybe it doesn't restack them in a different order and I, I, it's it's tricky because it's one of those things that the browser is something you use all the time and the behavior of you know how quickly you can get to the the, the tabs that you, you want to get to and how quickly you can get to new tabs that contain the thing you want to go to yeah. is critical. And having not even tried this, I mean, it's it's interesting blog post and interesting video, but I've never tried it. So I don't know how it will perform, you know, in, yeah. in real life. One of the key things is they believe, and I quote, the bottom edge is the most pleasurable edge to use. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, the bottom edge is given over to the app developer. So um, on um, on Ubuntu phone, the app developer decides what the bottom edge does. So the top is the indicator. The right edge is where you switch applications. The left edge is where you pull out the launcher. And the bottom edge is just for you if you're a developer. So you choose what to do with it. It might be a zoom option. It might be a quick flick to, to I don't know, create a new calendar event if you're a calendar or uh, flick up to skip a track if you're a music app or something. But that... That's that. That's what the whole premise of the bottom edge is, is that it's given to the developer. It's yours. You can do what you like with it. Mm. As long as they don't all use it for something different and conflict. That's entirely what they will do. Well, yeah, what you were saying about one of them using it for Zoom. There's lots of different apps that might want Zoom. And... Yeah, but it's yeah, but it, that's my point. If 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 you want to do Zoom, you could do it with the bottom edge. That's that's yeah. yours to use. Oh, I, I get that for a developer, right? But the predictability of it for the user then it yeah. could be a bit. Every time you start mm, a new app, you're like, going to be what's ooh, the bottom, what's edge, the bottom edge for? <laughs> that's the exciting! Isn't it? It's yeah. like an Easter egg, isn't it? It's like <laughs> if I pull up from the bottom, I get this. That's brilliant. <laughs> but I can see where your inputs come in because it's Uh-oh. it's easily <laughs> accessible at any time and ergonomically friendly to the typical one hand phone hold. Yeah, that's uh, which you always go on about. Yeah, my my lady hands. Movie, <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> really? <laughs> movie. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, moving on. <laughs> Gonna stand behind that curtain for a minute. <laughs> okay. Just to Who see are? if I can tell. 
Laura, I think it's uh, quick. Uh, yeah, please. sorry, I'm in the wrong tab. Ironically. <laughs> There's a story about Ubuntu 12.10, I think, is, uh, is the It next thing is. Up. So, Quantal Quick Quack. <laughs> <laughs> quick Quack Pretzel or something. <laughs> quick Quack Pretzel. Um, 12.10 has now reached the end of its support, so we don't have to worry about how to pronounce it anymore. Hooray! <laughs> Yay! Well, let's not have another one with a weird name, please. <laughs> well, the next one's V. It's going to be very yeah, exactly. vermicious. Yeah. So, this is 12.10, had an 18-month life cycle uh well given that's uh 2012 october and now it's may 2014 yes good i I can count to i have a feeling that without using the fingers on your lady hands (laughs) (laughs) was where it all started going wrong for me on my old laptop yeah 1210 wasn't stellar no in my mind no i don't think i think i might still be on 1210 here Ooh, uh, that explains I'm a lot. still on <laughs> 12 or 4. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. I Well, you know, I've run them all because I upgrade early. And yeah, 1210 wasn't fabulous. Well, yeah. um, the, um, the release after the LTS. Yeah. Forever cursed. The <laughs> in inverted commas cowboy release. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, that, Not that you're calling your stuff cowboys. No, no, no. no uh, Not your stuff. That's why I said, <laughs> in, that's why I said in inverted commas, meaning yeah. some people might say that. I wouldn't say that. You said that. Right. Uh, Geek.com have published a video showing Ubuntu running on the new Microsoft P- Surface Pro 3, which can replace your laptop. It can. With the little Surface Thing keyboard. What's it called? Yes. I well, don't know. Quite Touch cool thing. But yes. Yeah, they do look so quite nice. no, But notably, it's, um, he basically has it with Windows on, turns it off, sticks a USB stick in the side and presses a special like key a combination. And then um, it boots with no secure boot witness. So Just that's like obviously all, yeah. all quite, yeah, right. yeah. quite well quite nice. sorted out. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well. Yeah, and it runs, he, you know, he makes some points about how, like, so on some of the other older Surface generations, there were some things which weren't quite right, like problems with the Wi-Fi and problems with the, like, there's a stylus pointery thing. And he says that it's actually, like, improved quite a lot and that it's a lot more usable on the Surface 3 than it was on the previous models mm. but it, yeah but it's not quite perfect but it's a lot better yeah and i think i would be interested to see it running unity 8 actually uh with because that's more touchy friendly than mm. unity 7 is because like unity 7's got like buttons that are hard to press and the uh unity 8 sort of swipe swipe gestures and stuff like that would be interesting and it's quite a high-res display as well yes it is well if you know anybody who's got a surface pro 3 oh you're probably the only one <laughs> um <laughs> Why not yeah. get them to give it a go? And, uh, send I don't know, they feedback. might know somebody who works for Microsoft. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. In other news, the maintainer of the Cinnamon desktop PPA for Ubuntu has announced that stable packages will no longer be maintained as older versions of known packages are no longer provided in the Ubuntu repositories. Is that current stable packages or stable packages full stop? Ever. So Cinnamon, they had two PPAs. They had one that was like a daily build of Cinnamon mm-hmm. that was done in one PPA. And then there was a stable, like that things would get promoted to the stable PPA periodically. Yeah. And um, this that, that PPA disappeared a little while back. Okay. And Cinnamon um, was actually in Ubuntu, the, the official Ubuntu repository. It's not a PPA, but there was a version in Ubuntu um, before 14.04, but it was dropped. Um, and it looks like it's being dropped in Debian as well because it wasn't being very well maintained. There weren't there weren't active developers working on bugs. So there was a bug filed in Launchpad, and I saw an IRC discussion where they were talking about should we just drop Cinnamon because there's these bugs that mean it's broken and nobody seems to be looking after it. So people, there was, sorry, there was a bit of a brouhaha about oh, a bunch of dropping Cinnamon. And, uh, and it's like <laughs> yeah, in exactly the same way we would drop any other package that's unmaintained and broken. Which, you know, some would say Cinnamon is being maintained. It is in the later versions, but the version that was actually in the repository uh, is not being maintained. So that's why it was dropped, I believe. And right. so it's, it, it's weird. There was some backlash about him removing this stable PPA. But it's interesting that the stable PPA being the only real way you can get um, Cinnamon on Ubuntu is gone. But it is being maintained in Mint. So... Oh. I so think in, in theory, those packages should run on Ubuntu, shouldn't they? Potentially, yeah. Or you could just switch to Mate. Yes, do More that. on that next show. And yeah. finally, we've got a quick event to let you know about, which is the OpenStack Meetup in London on the 4th of June. Um, register at the link, which we will put in the show notes, um, with a discount code, uh, which is 
O S capital O capital S fourteen E B. Yeah, we'll capital put that in the show notes as well. Yeah. yeah, capital B. So, what's the discount get you? Uh, I don't know actually because I haven't registered. But uh, yeah, apparently it gives you a discount. Are you going to go? I don't know. Oh. Go to that, and you might see Alan there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. It's cloud. <laughs> yeah. be, a bit, be a bit foggy with it. You're a bit more of a Low mobile kind of guy. I'm a client guy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that's all the community news. Anyway. <laughs> That's all for this episode, episode nine. Join us next week when we'll be talking to Martin Wimpress from the Mate or Mate project. He does both, does he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you say to matey, I say Marty. Uh, <laughs> or Mate. Do you really? Yeah. <laughs> I did just then. I think. Okay. <laughs> just about. Yes, we talked to Martin about that. We'll have a, a gooey love and we're going to have some feedback as well. So uh, let us know what you've been thinking about. We might read it out on the show. Mm. Don't yeah, go away. Don't go away. If you're listening live, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Um, everybody else, we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.